We begin this evening with the feathered lifeboat disaster, which claimed the lives of nine local men and one Norwegian 100 years ago this week. In a brief respite from last week's storms, Orla Rappel travelled to the village of Feathered in County Wexford to hear this story of bravery and tragedy. Well, we're, we're about a mile from the village, uh, where the Keirk Islands are here now, to the left of those, that's Collinstown. And out further east, yeah, you're looking into uh, Kilmore. That's Kilmore Key over there. It's a bay, this is Feathered Bay, right around. Collinstown is over here to the left. That's, that's Collinstown in there. Th- that's where the bodies would have washed in. The sun is hitting the sea as it rocks lightly into Feathered Bay in County Wexford, making it hard to fathom what people saw here along the small dock 100 years ago. On February 20th, 1914, the steel hulled Mexico, a Norwegian schooner bound for Liverpool with timber, was in distress at the barren windswept islets, the Kiroks, off the mouth of Bano Bay. A group of feathered men strive to rescue the crew of the Mexico. And the 14 men set out for the Kiroks and within an hour, of getting there, there was nine of them drowned. On board the lifeboat, the Helen Blake that day were two first cousins, Richard and William Bird, and their uncle, Christopher Bird. Today, some of the relations of the birds lost at sea still live in Feathered. Richard Bird is my granduncle. Uh, Christopher Bird was my great granduncle. And William Bird was a first cousin of Richard Bird. This is Owen Bird, a man who grew up hearing the story of his family members and their colleagues' bravery, a bravery that influenced him. And that's actually why I joined the lifeboat myself. However, the experience of the men on the Helen Blake lifeboat would have been very different to how a rescue is carried out today. It would be hard for us to imagine because they would have gone out in a, an ordinary rowing boat um, in treacherous conditions. It would have been sleet showers, they would have been cold and wet. Uh, they would have only had um, life jackets made from cork. So they would have been wet and cold from the start of the service. So it's, very, it's completely different. You couldn't compare what happened, what would happen today with what happened 100 years ago. Weather conditions were atrocious on Friday, February 20th, 1914. Sleet and rain and bouts of snow hit the stormy seas. The lifeboat Helen Blake was being kept as usual in a brick shed just up from the dock. But the, the lifeboat was, was kept in this house. Um. Liam Ryan researched the story of the feathered lifeboat disaster for his book, The Awful Tragedy of the Helen Blake Lifeboat. Christopher Bird was the cox. He um, actually removed the, or took the lifeboat out on our carriage that very day because there was the young farmers were planning on having a, a dance that evening. Um, now Christopher always kept the, the lifeboat in good shape. He always had the lifeboat house in good trim. It was always tidy and he was you know, considered to be a very meticulous type of man. One of the lifeboat crew, Bill Banville, was grazing cattle when he saw the schooner Mexico in trouble near the Kirox. A maroon was fired and the crew gathered at this lifeboat shed. Whatever happened, Bill Banville, no one knows, but he was late coming for the, the launch, even though he was the man who reported it. So he came running down the slipway, didn't have time to grab a life jacket, hopped into the boat. There was already, Richard Bird had, um, had never been in the lifeboat before, but because Bill Banville was nowhere to be found, he went ahead, but he chose to stay in the lifeboat and the 14 men set out for the Kirox. Bill Banville, the man who raised the alarm, and eight of his colleagues were killed that day. Banville was quite um, badly mutilated in the, you know, that he must have um, struck rocks when um, he was um, thrown overboard. He was only identified some days after the event by the repairs he had made to his boots. In fact, one of the crew of the Mexico interviewed after he was rescued said that the sea was almost red with blood. Richard Bird, who had never been in the lifeboat before, was one of the five who survived. 
They cling to the rocks of the Kirox until Monday morning, when along with the men of the Mexico, they were all finally rescued. But Richard, even though he survived on the day, he was badly damaged. His spine was, was damaged and, and it couldn't be repaired at the time. Medical advances weren't uh, able to do anything for him, so he, he died within two years. You could say there was ten victims, really, because his quality of life wasn't great afterwards. Like, he died within... Like, he would have been in pain for years, with, for the couple of years with his back and his spine, and he just pined away. He was 24 when he died, and uh, he died actually six days short of the second year anniversary of the tragedy, so he didn't get two years. Apple reporting there from Feathered. For more on this story, I'm joined from our Waterford studio by author Liam Ryan and on the phone by Brian Murphy from the Rosslair Lifeboat Memorial Committee. Gentlemen, uh, good afternoon to you. Good evening to you. Good evening, Miles. Good evening, Miles. Now, this was the beginning, the, the attempted rescue. This was the beginning of a three-day ordeal for the survivors, for the, the, if you can call them, the fortunate members of the crew of the Helen Blake who had not drowned and for the local communities who attempted to rescue them. Liam, Take the story up. It's day one. The survivors are clinging to the rocks. How many men are there and what happens next? Um, there was um, five feathered men and um, nine of the Mexico, or sorry, eight of the Mexico crew. Um, but the first thing um, happened was that um, one of the Mexico crew, Antonio de la Cuna, aged 21, um, died from hypothermia. So the first thing the feathered men had to do was to um, dig a grave for the, the Norwegian sailor. And um, they found an old axe had washed in on the island and they um, dug a shallow grave, covered the body with sa some sail cloth and um, put sods over it to stop it blowing away. And the body was would have been removed at some point in the future. The body wasn't yeah. left there, was it? No, the body was taken away the day after the rescue, the 24th of February. Um, now, tell me about the other lifeboats then that uh, were involved, lifeboats from that area. Yeah, well, the, um, the Ross Lair Fort lifeboat, the Kilmore lifeboat and the Dunmore East lifeboat were all involved in the rescue. Um, but prior to that, the locals, um, Charlie Cook, Ned Bryan, Mark Sparden and the Peeler Kelly got a hold of a couple of pair of horses and um, dragged the boat to the shore on Grange and uh, attempted to rescue the men themselves before the lifeboats could even get there. But um, they were they were unsuccessful because the sea was so bad. And uh, I think people on the shore had a telescope and they were actually looking, they were trying to identify who had survived, who was on the island. That's right, Miles. Yeah, they, they had a brass telescope set up um, just at the back of Feather Dock near the ruin of an old windmill. Um, but at that time... Um, they didn't know how many people were on the Mexico, so they clung to the hope that there was an awful lot more of the feathered men alive than there actually was. Well, that hope was dashed fairly quickly because bodies began to wash ashore fairly soon, didn't they? That's right. While the lifeboats, the Don Maurice lifeboat and the Ross Lair lifeboat, which was towed there by the Wexford tug, while they were trying to attempt a rescue on the islands, um, six bodies washed in on Collinstown Strand. And... Identification was very difficult. It was. Um, two of the bodies in particular were pretty mutilated and uh, there was some debate, um, you know, as to one of them. They were convinced it was John Kelly, who was actually one of the survivors. But um, because um, Paddy Stafford had um, an unusual tuft of hair growing from one side of his head, it, that was the only thing that um, they identified him with. But that was only after the rescue had taken place when they could actually discover that John Kelly was alive and well. Now, when these lifeboats arrive from Rosslair Fort, from uh, Dunmore East and from, from Kilmore Quay, what, what, did, what were they able to do in the, in the early hours after the, of the, the tragedy? Well, basically, they could do nothing. Um, the, the seas were mountainous. The winds were strong. There was, you know, gale force winds. There was, you know, rain showers. Heel, hail showers, sleet, you know, they, um, they just could not get anywhere within 300 yards of the islands. And um, in 
the case of the Ross Lair lifeboat, they had to give up at four o'clock and the Wexford tugboat um, brought them back as far as Cheek Point. And the Dunmore East lifeboat um, went to Feathered Dock and um, they were looked after by the local community while they stayed in um, on standby, you could say, in Feathered Village. Meanwhile, on the island, you already have one death from hypothermia and there must have been a risk that there would, would be others. Yes, they, they had very little food. Um, all they had was a couple of tinned, um, couple of tins of beef, um, I think even a tin of pineapples, you know, a, a bottle of wine and a half a bottle of brandy, which um, between, you know, all the men didn't go very far. So literally they, they lived on barnacles and um, Gary Hendrick had some chaw tobacco, which um, I think he even shared among his um, fellow feathered men. One of the things that interests me about this story is that they, they sent to London for an RNLI in the Royal National Lifeboat Institution inspector. What was all that about and what did they think this person was going to be able to do and how quickly would he get there? Well, Commander Holmes was um, in the, the Royal National Lifeboat. You know, you have to remember that um, Ireland was still under um, British rule at the time. So it was um, the RNLI were desperately trying to save the men. Um, Commander Holmes was a, a, a naval commander. He was dispatched to Ireland and he called to Kilmore um, and decided that there was no way the rescue could be effected from Kilmore. So he was brought to Feathert and um, he was no... I'd say he was five minutes in Feathert when um, he was down at the dock and the Dunmore East lifeboat with Ned Bryan, the local hero, and Mark Sparden acting as a pilot brought him out to to view the scene and to see what they could do. Um, his presence certainly gave um, the locals a lift. I think they felt that maybe with this guy from London that maybe, you know, something could happen. And, you know, he was quite keen. Um, he got going early Monday morning and uh, with the locals, you know, Ned Bryan fired the rocket on the Monday morning, which, um, you know, effectively um, got a line to the island, which ultimately resulted in the rescue of the men. And this was Holmes, Holmes's contribution. This was his idea, wasn't it? No. Oh, it wasn't? No, it, it was um, Ned, Ned Bryan had to, was a local coast guard. Um, you know, it should be remembered that... Um, you know, the locals in Feathert did everything they could to um, to get their their men back. So it was a you know it was a big effort of you know the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the the Irish Coast Guards and the locals. And Ned Bryan was you know somewhat ahead of his time, I suppose. He um, had this idea that if we could fire this rocket, you know, from the lifeboat and get a line to the island, well, you know, we could get you know the men off, and that had never been done anywhere before. So. And how do they actually get them off? I mean, do they literally attach themselves um, to the line? How, how do they how do they manage to exit the island? Well, the the Dunmore boat brought a, a small rowing boat with them, with um, two life belts and a life jacket in it. And once they had got the line to the island, they floated the boat down. But unfortunately, it was smashed in the on the rocks. But um, John McNamara managed to grab the the life belts. And he said, to hell with this. He said, I'm giving this a go. And um, the men on the Dunmore East lifeboat towed John Mack through the surf. And when John Kelly saw that John McNamara had made it to the Fanny Harriet, he, um, he said, well, I'm out of here as well, because at that stage, things were getting pretty critical. Um, you know, of, of the five men that were rescued, you know, the five feathered men that were rescued, um, John Kelly was the only one that could actually walk ashore in Feathered that very day. And uh, when conditions were still very, very bad. They were, but um, now having once the Dunmore men had got the two Feathered men on board the Fanny Harriet, the Ross Lair boat had arrived from Cheek Point under tow with the Wexford tugboat and they um, they managed to get into a better position than the, um, than the, the Dunmore boat and they had a small rowing boat with them and they... The, the, the Dunmore boat gave them the line, you know, gave the Ross Lair boat the line and they um, they managed to float a boat down with Ned, um, what's his name, Ned Wickham, Jem Wickham and um, Bill Duggan. And they, um, you know, they managed then to take two men off at a time. They made five trips. Um, at one stage, the boat got um, stove in on um, rocks. So Ned Wickham the Cox threw them a loaf of bread, which they wrapped in a, an oilskin, stuffed the hole in the boat and, pro and 
within I think slightly over an hour and a half they um, had all men on board the um, the Ross Lair lifeboat Well we'll talk about James Duggan, uh, Duggan uh, Wickham rather and, and uh, Bill Duggan in a few minutes but uh, Brian um, uh, we've heard there Liam talking about the Ross Lair Force lifeboat and in case anybody thinks well, presumably thinks that uh, he's made a mistake and he really means the Ross Lair Port lifeboat he doesn't he means the Ross Lair Fort lifeboat which is a place that up to a few days ago I'd never heard of why have I never heard of it? Well, in, in, it's remarkable that a, a number of people in Rosslare haven't heard of it either, and yet it was the, the major part of the village through all the last centuries. Uh, Rosslare Fort was actually a fort back to the time of the Confederation of Kilkenny, where they had fortified Wexford Harbour. It, it lay at the end of the Rosslare Peninsula, which at that time was twice the length it is today. And it was a fortified uh, structure which had cannons which defended the harbour because Wexford Harbour at that time was a very very busy trading port traded with all with Britain and many ports in Europe and beyond and it was literally littered with hundreds of schooners which were the freighters of the day bringing coal and bringing timber out bringing coal in and various other other uh, uh, items of trade um, so Rosslare Fort, at that time, the, the, that was, the Wexford Harbour was, had a very narrow entrance, and Rosslare Fort was opposite the Raven Point on one side, Rosslare Fort on the other. But over the years, and with the building of the slob lands within Wexford Harbour, it changed the tidal structures, and the actual peninsula of Rosslare began to erode. Uh, and in 1922, of the first breach of the peninsula came through the peninsula into the Wexford Harbour and left Rosslare Fort as an island. And it eventually succumbed to the sea in 1925. Um, it had been threatened for many years before that because they were being flooded. And actually, what, what Liam was saying when Edward Wickham, the coxswain of the Rosslare boat, was uh, attempting the rescue on the Keurig Islands, his second coxswain, Jim Wickham, uh, his house was flooded on the fort back at home to a depth of three feet, and his family had to be evacuated while he was on the, the, the famous mm. rescue of the Mexico and the lost crewmen of the but Helen Blake. Extraordinary that the village was essentially washed away in, the, in, in its entirety in the 1920s. Um, now, people have an image of what a lifeboat looks like today. Describe what a lifeboat looked like 100 years ago. Well, at the time, the Rosslare boat was, was, was uh, a boat called the James Stevens, and she was uh, what was known as a pulling sailing lifeboat because it was basically, uh, it was a larger boat than the Helen Blake because it was uh, more or less a seagoing lifeboat, uh, which was moored at sea all the time. It, it wasn't a housed boat. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, say four feet out of the water, up to the gunnel, and it was just an arrangement of ropes hanging out of it. It could sail, it could raise sail, and could make good speed at sail. Uh, it was rowed by ten men, who were usually a recruited local crew from the area. Um, and it, 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 the only way it could get to the Kirox, because it was a journey of six and a half hours behind a tug, which was the tug Wexford, commanded by Lawrence Busher, Captain Busher. And that tug was a very heroic ship in its own right because it really wasn't a seagoing tug. It was a tug which was used for, for moving the schooners around Wexford Harbour. And it was a steam paddle tug. It, it looked more like an, a Mississippi steamboat than anything else. So it was an amazing feat for those men to actually make the two ships to get from Rosslare Harbour. Because remember, Kilmore is between Rosslare Fort and the Keirocks, and the Kilmore boat made heroic efforts to launch, but it couldn't launch against the sea. But the only reason Rosslare could do it was that it had the tug to assist. Now, we've mentioned James Wickham and Bill Duggan, who were two of the rescuers from Rosslare Fort. They have a unique distinction, I think. This would make a wonderful trivia, a quiz trivia question at some point in the future. Who are the only two men to have uh, All-Ireland final medals without having actually participated in the All-Ireland final? And they That's are right. James Wickham and Bill Duggan. Why That's is right. that? And the reason why is that they, 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 they have this distinction is that they were the two men on the Rosslare lifeboat who volunteered to, to, to man the punt, the little boat, which they got off the tug. The, the, the tug had a little punt which the crew used to go in and out to the harbour in. 
and they, man- they, re- they reckoned when they got the lifeboat moored off the island, the only way to approach the island to get the survivors off was to send in a small boat. So they put in the punt, and the two men that volunteered to do that were James Wickham and Bill Duggan. James Wickham was the second cox, and Bill Duggan was the bowman. And now, they're, they're, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Quite, sorry, just to, to, to finish. They went in on the first run, and they managed to get two survivors off, and they brought them back to the lifeboat. But on the second run of the punt, they could only take two at a time. The second run, the punt actually hit the rocks and was holed. And the way they stopped it on the day was that they had they'd brought uh, bread and an oil skin with them in case they got stranded on the island as well for, for to, to, to actually share out among the survivors. And they used the bread and the oil skin to block the hole in the little punt. And they got two more men off and, and back with the hole in the punt. And then the decision was to be made. They had the rest of the people on the island, and they volunteered that they would go back again, and they made another four runs from the lifeboat into the island with the hole in the little boat and the bread just blocking the water from coming in. Extraordinary heroism and extraordinary ingenuity. And uh, Liam, there are apparently lots of photographs from this this whole event. Why are there so many photographs in existence? Um, we're very lucky, really, because um, one of the, the Poole family from Waterford was actually uh, married to the Hornicks in um, Johns Hill in Feathered on Sea. And um, they obviously got word to Pools to um, come down to Feathered um, and they um, more or less photographed the drama as it unfolded. And um, there's quite an extensive um, collection of um, photographs that exist about this tragedy. And um, it was, um, you know, the local people newspaper published a full page of photographs, which um, kind of caught the imagination or the attention of the entire world. And... um, you know, there was money poured in from all quarters to the victims' families. Including from, from, from Norway in That's particular. Right. And we've, we've yeah. lots of those photos on our website. So visit rte.ie forward slash history show if you want to have a look at those images. I know there are a number of centenary commemorations taking place in Feathered and in Ross Lair. And uh, those details of those are also on our website. I believe the Norwegian ambassador is uh, coming down to Wexford for the commemorations. Uh, Brian Murphy of the Ross Lair Lifeboat Memorial Committee and Liam Ryan, author of the awful tragedy of the Helen Blake lifeboat. Many thanks for joining me with that fascinating story.